You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. To the chasers of light, to the purveyors of pictures, to all of you listening around the world, we welcome you to the F11 Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Deal, and joining me, your co host, Brandon Gorey. <laughs> How are you doing, man? <laughs> so far, so good. I, uh, you know, as soon as I heard we were here to talk about the Holga Challenge, that's when I knew it was going to be a good one. Oh, the Holga Challenge is going to be great. So, for those of you who don't know what a Holga is, Holga is a toy camera, and the model specifically that we're going to be discussing today is the 120N. Now, what that is, it's a thirty to forty dollar. Medium format camera. Yeah, that's true. You can go out and you can get your Portrait 400 120 or you can shoot your um, uh, Ilford Delta or whatever it is, your Cinestill, and you can put it inside of this cheap $30 to $40 camera and get some, well, unique results. Would you agree? Uh, unique in the very definition of the term unique. It's you're not going to get this quality from many other cameras, I can tell you that. Yeah, those cameras, they're cheap, and they do not, uh, well, they just don't deliver. So let me let me tell you about the Hoga Challenge. So Brandon and I had some drinks, uh, which is what we do, and we uh, concocted the Hoga Challenge, which was, we, we both are film shooters, okay? So we, but we both love shooting on our medium format film. And we got talking about things, and we both found out that neither one of us have ever shot on a Holga camera before. And we were like, well, I guess we got to figure that out, and we got to do that. So we made the Holga challenge, and we had very loose rules. We, we each had a roll of Ilford HP 5 Plus, uh, which is a really uh, – versatile film stock and then we decided to uh to use an expired roll of uh 160 vc portra which uh knowing what we know now about the uh, shutter speeds on the hogos was not a great decision but it was our very first roll so we didn't know any better yeah you know looking back if i could uh if i could go back in time and make changes to my life i would have not shot 160 on the holga it didn't help that we shot on a cloudy day, um, so that really put things into perspective. I think the the lowest you can go on a Holga is f8, or I guess that's the, the widest aperture. And so f8 paired with a standard, what was it, one two hundredth, one one hundredth shutter speed, supposedly. So about that. So to 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 set this up, if you're fascinated by this episode. What I want you to do is I want you to go into the description of this episode and we will link you up to each of our Hoga episodes. So we both shot the same model, this really talented model here in Austin named Tatum. And we decided to uh, take her around the streets of Austin and uh, just try to get good pictures out of the camera and use the different film stocks. Now, uh, as we described, it's a toy camera. The uh, lens is plastic, so there's no glass. Um, you do not see what you're, you're, you're getting in focus. So if you're a manual shooter or you just shoot autofocus, whatever, you're used to maybe looking through your viewfinder or whatever and seeing your subject go in and out of focus. You do not see that. It's like just a rangefinder type thing off the side. You just look through it, a little, a little uh, eyepiece you look through. And then there's just icons. You have an icon of one person, which is supposedly three feet. Uh, and then you have an icon of two people, which is supposedly six feet. Then you have an icon of seven people, signifying a group shot, which is supposedly 18 feet. And then you have a mountain, okay? And then uh, for your shutter, you have two options. You have N, which I guess means normal, which is supposedly one one hundredth of a second. And then you have 
B for bulb, but there's also not a shutter release on there, so I'm not really sure why you would ever put it in bulb just to get things uh, blurry. However, I was told by somebody in a Holger group that there is actually a device you can hook up to it to do shutter release stuff. I'm like, man, it's a $30 camera. Why would you get that invested into it? But yeah, apparently there's a really uh, big cult, fault, cult following on that. And then as Brandon alluded to, you have a sunny mode and a cloudy mode, which is supposedly F11 and F8. Now, coming up on film... Back when I used to shoot, I had to use the F-16 rule. And what the F-16 rule teaches us, if you are not hip to the F-16 rule, I'm going to explain it right now. The F-16 rule, back in the, you know, and this is true, it's just, it's it's the electromagnetic spectrum and physics, but back when we would shoot on film, you know, you would have your box speed. So if I go out and I buy T-Max 100, that is 100 box speed, ASA 100. And what you would do is, uh, the F-16 rule was called also the Sunny 16 rule. So at F-16, I can shoot my box speed matched to my shutter speed. So if I have 100 speed film at F-16, one one hundredth of a second is what I should expose for. Using that with the Holga made absolutely no sense because if I had 400 speed film and I were shooting at, say, F-8, and the shutter was at one one hundredth of a second, it should be a lot brighter than it is. But what the results were is a lot of the shots were underexposed. Uh, even on a, okay, so it was a it was a cloudy day. It wasn't like heavily cloudy, but just a cloudy day. Okay, so uh, instead of being, a, I think you had to be like one sixteen hundredth of a second if you're shooting at uh, ISO 400 on a sunny day. So then you'd be at eight hundredth of a second on a cloudy day or something like that, or 400, or even if it was at 200, that's still like you would, you, you should at one, one hundredth of a second, you should still be getting really well exposed uh, film, especially with a very tolerant film like Ilford uh, HP five, which you can overexpose a stop and it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed the results from the, uh, the Ilford HP five and, you know, going by the sunny 16 rule, the one sixty should have been fine. A little bit of backstory. It was expired in 2004, but I also had I also received this bag of expired film that, that I you know I gave to Kevin and myself to try out, and I'd run tests on it with five other uh, five other rolls of film, and everything came out just just dandy. So uh, it is it is still one of the elusive things to this experiment to this experience, um, and I don't think we're any better off for uh, for having experienced it. You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. I know that there's a big cult following of the Holga cameras, but here's here's where my uh, big problem with the Holga camera is. Film. Brandon, how much is a box of uh, five rolls of Portra 400 right now? Right now, prior to the, the price increase, I think it's around $60 on the low end. Yeah, but mainly you, it's really closer to about seventy five these days. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it for upwards of seventy five dollars for a box. Um, and and so my point being is is why would you go out and buy a thirty dollar camera that takes really muddy and ghosty looking photos that has an in, inconsistent shutter? Everything's out of focus. It basically looks like mush. Why would you spend that kind of money on mush? And and you know to me. I'm I'm too I'm too much of a control freak, and, and the thing about the camera that that really uh, pissed me off the most is that I couldn't control the results. So you know people are like, oh, it's the carpenter, not the tools. Well, if your tool decides that it's gonna not be at a one one hundredth of a second and it's gonna just do whatever it wants to do, and if your tool so decides to leak light despite the fact that you've taped it up and tried to uh, you know eliminate the light leaks. When you talk to the Holga fanboys, they're like, well, that's just the charm of the camera. And it's like, well, man, like if I can't control the result, like when I look through a viewfinder on a camera, I am picturing something that is going to be a final result. Now, sometimes there's some slight variances from that. But if I if I have this beautifully composed picture of a model and I'm like, yes, and then I hit the shutter and then I go develop it and you just see like this ghost and it's just this mush. I'm sorry, I, that's not photography in my opinion. That is a bunch of flaws in your camera preventing you from being a photographer because you didn't control those results and there's literally nothing you could do to control those results. So to me, it's not photography. You're just kind of like wasting film. 
with that being said, I don't want to lay into Holga too much because it is one of the, it's more of a novelty camera and I think it's marketed that way. I mean, you know, it also begs the question is just, you know, why buy a Polaroid when to get a Fujifilm Instax Polaroid camera, they're like anywhere from 80 to 130, depending on the edition you get. And then you go and get the Polaroids themselves. And if they're the large ones, I believe they're like $2 a Polaroid. And if you're using the flash at any at any given time, there's like a there's like a six out of ten chance that photo's not gonna come through. So, you know, given that given that you, you know, Kevin and I are both photographers who who love to curate the photos and, and spend a lot of time doing this, the Holga was you know, you almost had to like take a back seat on your own driving and just go like, all right, you know, whatever happens, happens, you know, Kevin and I really had to turn into Buddhists to shoot this camera and to, to spend our time and our money on the, on the film and the cameras to shoot these cameras and to, to get the results that we got, we had to practice a little bit of, uh, a little bit of tolerance, patience and, uh, acceptance. Well, and it's interesting because there is a there are a bunch of uh, fans, and there's a huge Holga group, a huge Holga community out there. And I actually joined a group on Facebook because I was I, I really loved some of the shots that I took of Tatum, uh, how I composed them. I hated the way they turned out after they got developed, and I was like, "Damn, uh, those some of those shots I might actually post." Uh, on social media sometime, you know, uh, and, and so, uh, but they're so technically poor that I would no longer want to put my name on them. And so I, I went into a group and I talked to some guys and I'm like, oh, well, you just need to flock your camera. I'm like, flock it, like spray paint the inside of it with flat black paint. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's all you got to do because you, you're, you've got internal reflections. And I'm like, okay. So this morning I released another YouTube episode follow-up to my Hoga challenge episode. And I did a, uh, an episode where I flock the Hoga and, uh, you know, you can go check it out if you want to, but I'm going to tell you my results right now. My results are that it made absolutely no difference at all. I gave Sherwin Williams $10 and that's literally all that happened. And I also used a roll of uh, HP5, and it has the exact same light leaks where it is, where it was on the uh, the Hoga challenge. So, I have some guy who reached out to me today, who is such a Hoga enthusiast that he has a coffee table book that he's put out about the Hoga, and he says it's 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 happening through your lens, and he he said go get a flashlight, go take it in your closet. And shine the flashlight around the edges of your, your your lens and and see if you can see light. So I turn off the lights in the closet and sure enough on the right side, which is where the, the burn in was happening, that's 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 what was going on. So you know you know what I concluded from that? Don't buy gear that you have to do that with in the first place. You know what I concluded <laughs> from that? <laughs> I, I concluded that those people exist, the people that will tell you to put a flashlight through a Holga lens. You know, uh, back in the day, those people used to be locked up, but they're now, you know, they're out in the streets. They post on the Internet, so not much we can do about that. <laughs> it, I, I got to the point where it's like, you know, the lesson here is that I bought a $30 camera, you know, and uh, that, 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 that's the, you get what you get. And so as somebody who owns a Mamiya C330, uh, which, by the way, uh, if you're not familiar, the Holga shoots in two formats. You can standard shoot it in 6x6, or you can change it up to 6x4.5. And then they make some aftermarket things you can buy to shoot 35 millimeter through and all that. But uh, the bottom line here is I think we're both telling you don't buy the Holga. You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. You know, I'm going to be... <sighs> I'm going to be honest, as someone who is such a, a perfectionist in their own shots, I thought the shots I got back from the Holger, and I might add that Kevin did develop and home develop and home scan all of the Ilford HP5 shots really, really damn well. So I might, I might have to attribute that to Kevin. But upon receiving the shots, I, I truly did enjoy uh, the imperfections and... It was, it was just, it brought me back to those early stages in film where I was just happy to, to get the film back. And I think that, I think in some way that's extremely important. Um, I, I also, 
did stage the shots purposefully so that, you know, a terrible camera couldn't mess them up so much. So the model was in a black dress and I tried my hardest to get her in front of a lighter background at any given time so that even if it was, even if the shots came out underexposed or super overexposed, at least there was going to be some separation uh, from subject and background. Yeah, well, uh, so I guess the other the other uh, thing to keep in mind is the inconsistency of the build quality. Because I remember when I scanned Brandon's shots and I was like, I don't see any light leaks here. I mean, they, they, he did a great job, uh, obviously, on the shots uh, as a photographer. But the things that he couldn't control, like the imperfections in his shots, I could have lived with. I thought that the imperfections looked great. Unfortunately, on my shots, like... If I put a roll of a roll of film in, so on six by six, if you're not hip to six by six, you can get twelve shots. On any given roll, I'd likely get two shots that were exposed correctly. And and there's because I have light leaks, a lot of it is based around how much time there is between my shots. So if I take a shot and I immediately take another shot after that, it hasn't had a lot of time to leak light onto the film. And then I wind it off to the next one. And so I actually went back and looked and sure enough, all, all the shots that I took, um, I was either in a really dark area uh, or I just was, it was quick rapid succession between the shots and so I didn't have a lot of time to, to screw up the, the, the film. And, you know, people can just be like, well, you just got a lemon. But I in the Holger group, I had <laughs> I had so many people in the Holger group, oh, you have the same thing happened to me. So, yeah, you know, shocker when you buy a toy camera, uh, you know, the bill quality isn't exactly going to be, like, uh, as good as a Hasselblad. Who would have thought? You know, it's funny you say that. I used to know a guy who... He used a Nikon, one of his first Nikon cameras. It wasn't his main camera, and he was a portrait photographer. He used this older Nikon camera that he dropped a while ago, and he actually chipped a bit of the hard plastic off near the the lens attachment area. And so he had like he had about a pin size crack going onto his um, going onto his sensor, and he would purposefully take photos with that camera on specific shoots because he liked the way that light would distort his images. And uh, for as long as I knew him, he told me that he liked to, you know, he told me that he was serious into photography and that he liked to not use that camera. It was just for funsies. Um, whenever I saw him, he was using that specific camera with the with the egregious light leak. So, you know, it's, you're not going to shoot a Holga and take it seriously. Obviously, it's a completely different kettle of fish. But I do think it's, I do think there's a, a comical choice about you know, intentionally just rolling the dice, and we'll just we'll see what we get. It's a plastic build camera. There's no light seals, you know. To take the back latch off, it doesn't swing on hinges. You literally, you literally have to slide up these like, these like tin fasteners, and then pull off a plastic back, and then there you go. That's all you got. I think choosing the Casablanca model was probably not the best choice either. Having a white camera that has light leaks, it's like, oh, wow, more light's hitting it, and it's white. And so I, I would imagine maybe if you are uh, going to uh, pull the trigger on a Holga, maybe look into getting an all-black model because, I mean – what do, what do we use to fill in shadows? We use a, a, a you know white reflector and things like that. And so like there's a I mean that camera's pretty bright the the white model. So maybe something else to keep in mind. Another thing that I noticed with it is that I do not buy that the shutter speed at least on mine was one one hundredth one one hundredth of a second because when you look at movement motion blur, uh, I took a picture of a skateboarder on the episode that uh, I put on today, today's YouTube episode, I took a picture of a skateboarder and you know, the skateboarders maybe 30 feet in front of me and he's moving on a skateboard. If I take a picture of a skateboarder at one, one hundredth of a second, you're going to get a little bit of blur. And so I'm, I'm convinced that my shutter is like between two, one, two fiftieth and 500, one five hundredth of a second. And knowing what I know about the F 16 rule, I think that that's true. And, but but when I look at my pictures that I took versus the pictures that you took, I think that a lot of your shots were about as bright as mine, so I would be willing to bet that your shutter is probably faster than a hundredth of a second as well. You know, that might actually answer the problem that we had with the Portra 160 VC is, um, yeah, as, as 
as tarnished as my photos were due to, and I had, I did have some light leaks, but not nearly as bad as yours. There were a couple like, you know, mild streaks that might change like a half stop of the blacks. But, um, in terms of movement on all the photos, they're, they're, you know, they all came out crisp. They might've been a bit blurry because they didn't get the, uh, the focus quite right. But, uh, the movement was definitely, it was crisp. Well, and going back to the Sunny 16 rule, I mean, if you are shooting at uh, F16 at 1 100th of a second, you have a box speed of, you know, one, you have a box speed of 100. Well, if it's a 100th shutter speed and you're shooting portrait 160, so you're at 160 and you're shooting at either F8 or F11, that should be a lot brighter than F16. But even then, some of our photos are turning out dark, which is to me why it has to be. It has to be over one one hundredth of a second for the shutter speed, just based off of that math alone. Yeah, and when we say dark, we don't mean underexposed. We mean we're we're talking about blank negatives here. I mean, I about six six out of the twelve negatives I got back were uh, were were you know you could only see like a fine detail in some of the corners where it was just like a neon sign light or something like that. It was pretty bad. Yeah, I I, I describe it as just a frustrating camera because when I'd be filming. Well, we would be filming behind the scenes, uh, you know, shots of ourselves. Like he'd be composing me, taking this really amazing shot of Tatum. She's like killing it on her pose, and I have a really good perspective. And then I click it, and then I develop it. And it's just this like cloudy mush, and it's just like, I mean, imagine how frustrating that would be if you're a photographer. And then what you see is not what you get. And to me, now technically you are you are recording light, so you are you are creating photography there. But in my opinion, just not creating good photography because it's not your vision. Yeah. And, you know, circling back, kind of like bringing it back to bang for your buck, you know, it's, if you're buying the film as it is, you know, just portra and a lot of people who are shooting film and who would be shooting a, a port, um, a Holga aren't going to be home developing or anything like that. So they're not going to save money there. So you're going to, you're probably going to be grabbing anywhere from a 15 to an, to an $18 roll of film that's going to cost you anywhere from 15 to 18 dollars for developing and scanning so it's 40 it's a 40 dollar roll for 12 shots on a 40 dollar camera you know congratulations you paid a hundred dollars in total for 12 shots of which half of them probably won't even come out when you can go to your local walgreens or cvs grab a disposable camera for 15 20 bucks you got 36 shots you've got flash and they're most likely all going to come back yeah, I agree. Um, it just uh, isn't a good investment, especially like like we said for the cost of film. So, um, you know, my my takeaway was, you know, am I going to use it in my future work? The answer is probably not, unless I'm intentionally just trying to make something look trashy. I'm, I'm I mean, my 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 Holga, like my my takeaway, is I probably need to buy another one, which I don't want to buy another one because i own two c330s so if i'm going to shoot in six by six i have two mamias to shoot in you know six by six so i i my, my takeaway was it was a, a really cool lesson to learn it was fun uh, but i don't i would never consider this to be a serious part of my photography moving forward and if i did it would definitely shoot black and white and i would absolutely recommend you use an ISO of over 400. You shoot it in the brightest mode possible, which is the cloudy mode. And uh, I wouldn't even shoot it on a cloudy day. I would just shoot it in the sun. You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. So yeah, basically to summarize, if you want a plastic camera where you cannot control the shutter speed, where you supposedly only have F8 and F11, you want to put really expensive film through it. You want to have absolutely no control whatsoever over the results. Then the Holga is right for you. However, it wasn't right for us. The medium format stuff we're shooting on, we want more perfection. We want better results. And uh, it was just mushy. But check out the links uh, to the original Holga Challenge. Uh, we both did our own episode on our respective YouTube channels. So Kevin Deal Photography, Brandon Gorey, uh, on YouTube. And then I also today released a follow-up episode. Um, cause I, I, I'm, I'm a stubborn person. I, I was like, I was like, I want to get a good shot out of this. I want to get consistent, good shots out of it. But 
it got to the point where it was like the law of diminishing returns. It was like, yeah, I could invest more money in this and become like some of these Hoga fanatics, but I'm not one. And so that's not a good use of my money. I'm a Mamiya fanatic. I, I love Mamiya cameras. I love shooting on Mamiya cameras. If I could get a Mamiya 7, my life would be amazing, but I don't want to spend $4,000 to have a small handheld 6x7. So I feel like you being a gearhead, that's just something that you'd wake up one morning and you just say, you know what? I'm going to buy a 6x7. Well, I own a, I, so that's the thing. I already own the RB67, so I have a 6x7 going for me. But yeah, The RB67, no one wants to say this. We're all thinking it. It's a home defense weapon. It is. It is. Like, if I if I threw an RB67 at you, you would die, and then the RB67 would just hit the ground and then break the ground, and then it would be like, okay. The RB67 would get up and start drinking coffee. You know what I could do is I could like take my Holga and just smash my RB67 on top of it and watch it just break into a million pieces. And the RB67, I'll pick it up and take a picture with it. That'd make a really good intro for a YouTube episode. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what you could do with the Holga is there's a guy that's been circulating around Instagram, and what he does is he takes disposable camera lenses and attaches them to lens covers on for different fittings for various cameras. Basically, what he does is he creates uh, his own filter to capture um, to capture photos with digital cameras through a disposable camera lens. So you could take you could technically take like Holga photos on a digital through the Holga lens and purposefully create those imperfections because I, I think with plastic lenses you get a different look on a lens like per lens basis. I think that would be much better use of my time than uh, trying to get that darn Holga camera to work. That's for sure. So, um, you're listening to the F11 photography podcast. We're going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, I think the takeaway here is don't buy a Holga unless you just want the camera to, uh, show off its imperfections for you and drive you crazy. Or maybe you just like to burn money. Maybe you just love wasting, uh, film and just not getting the results that you set out to get. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. You can catch us on all the major podcast platforms. We have a lot of uh, episodes coming up. Uh, The next one we're going to do is why we buy gear for ourselves and not our clients. I want to remind all of you to chase light and not algorithms, and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For more information about this podcast, go to www.f11pod.com.